to make uh, something that they wouldn't spoil. And that was the whole purpose of it. So they would roll their dough, and then they would roll the pepperoni in it, and the husbands could take it down and didn't have to worry about keeping it chilled because they couldn't. And it worked out perfect. It worked out perfect. So uh, that's that's how it got its beginning. And it was a country called Bakery, Teacher Argyro and the whole family, which we've known very much. And now the Florida family has a Chris, young Chris, and they're doing a fantastic job. But so many good ones. So they're all good. So anytime you get a pepperoni roll from North Central West Virginia, you got the real thing. All right. Now, I'm Sicilian. My producer, Nick Berzlini, today is Italian. You are Italian. It's Sunday, and it's your birthday, and your wife says, Joe, what Italian meal do you want me to make for you on your birthday? What are you picking? Well, it's not my birthday. It's her birthday. No, 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 but when, it, my, when it's your birthday. It's a, when it's my birthday. I, I, she makes the best spaghetti sauce and meatballs, so it's always been the best. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I'm, I'm still the— kind of a simple old favorite but uh, spaghetti you can't get any better than that when it's when it's handed down from uh from uh our little town in italy san juan fiore is where they all came from and my grandmother uh, rosa jacobin brought it over her her formula and her, her recipe and my grandmother kind of americanized it a little bit then my mother did and now my wife and it's got it. To, it's uh, they got it perfected, so it's the best. I still, I still enjoy it so much. I agree. I, was, I think they should make a candle that smells like spaghetti sauce. My wife's into <laughs> candles. Burns these candles. You burn a candle that smells like spaghetti sauce. I think that, that's the best smell in the world. Oh, slow cooking on the stove all day. That's what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Well, no, oh, it has to cook all day. You can. You can fill the house with garlic. Pass. You know. <laughs> yeah, you you, get, you can't fast track spaghetti, guys. You got to slow cook it. it. Yeah, it's got to be That's on this. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And you got to have some pork in that sauce too when you're cooking it. You do. You got to have pork. You got to have some meatballs. You got to have the. You yeah. know, it's all got to be there. Hey, uh, let's let's get down to some uh, some serious stuff here, and uh, let's okay. talk, let's talk pipelines because this is happening and it's yeah. a long time it's coming. It's, it, it's it's moving it now. MVP. It's been over ten years. It's uh, doubled in price because of all the litigation that's gone on and all the protests and this and that. But you know what? Here's the thing people don't understand is that you've got to, there has to be a market for the product or they're not going to approve a line. The FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is not going to approve you building a line just because you want to build one. That doesn't happen. So the bottom line was this line's been needed. The southeast down as far as the Carolinas and Virginias, they need the energy so badly down there, and our base is needed. And uh, we have uh, plenty of it, you know, the Marcellus and Utica Shell, and uh, it's just finally starting to flow, and it's going to be – means about $45 million a year in abalone taxes for the state of West Virginia, another $200 plus million for the property owners, royalty rights. So it's a tremendous game changer for West Virginia, and that's going to help the whole uh, southeast corridor. And also with our uh, demand for LNG, that's going to be for our allies around the world who need gas that get away from the Russian and uh, not be held captive by Putin. I saw a story today that said that the United States at this time has never produced more oil and energy than it is doing right now. It's, it's broken records you know, for production. Yeah. Well, the, the, the United States of America has produced more energy in 2023 than any place else in the world. We produce 38 trillion cubic feet of gas, 4.7 billion barrels of oil. No one's ever done that. That I know of, anyway, they recorded. But we were the largest producer of energy last year, and more solar and more wind than ever before. So we're an all-in policy. And when we wrote the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act bill, we wrote it for energy security. You use everything. You can't just do what you want to do. You got to do what the country needs and how we basically transition into a cleaner environment. But you can use. I tell people, you cannot eliminate your way to a clean environment. You can innovate it through technology. And that's exactly what we have done. And we're doing it and producing oil and gas cleaner and using it better than any place else in the world. And we're investing more in new technologies, especially uh, we have hydrogen coming on. We're working hard on that. We have nuclear reactors coming on. We're working hard on that. And uh, then you're going to have small modular reactors and you have uh, geothermal. So many things that we're doing. But basically, I've said this. We're producing energy that we need today for the energy we want to have for tomorrow and the new technology. So We've done it all. America has now – there's more investments in our country than ever under any piece of legislation we've ever done in the history of our country, they tell me. I want to hit all your topics first uh, before we get to some questions from John and Matt. And another one of those okay. topics is bump stocks today. We did a segment earlier this week with Art Tom 
uh, from uh, yeah. formerly a lobbyist with the NRA, now more so with the, uh, with the Gun Makers uh, Firearms Association in regards I to don't that. Know, I, I don't know what he said, Rob, but I can tell you this. It's ridiculous. There's a, that, that makes it full automatic, and there's no need for that. And we've outlawed full automatics forever. And the bottom line is that that turns a semi-automatic into full automatic. And there's been different. You can go on YouTube and see exactly what it does and how uh, lethal it's been. And back in 20, I think it was in 2019, uh, uh, you know, President Trump at that time, I supported wholeheartedly. He, you know, they out, you know, they basically uh, put a moratorium. You couldn't do them. You couldn't use them. And the courts overruled it. So now it's going to take legislation. And I'm a proud co-sponsor of that legislation. Art was uh, in favor of uh, overturn the over court to overturning the uh, bump stock ban, uh, as you might guess. Uh, but uh, part of the discussion that took place was whether or not it was constitutional for the ban, and the Supreme Court obviously felt it was not, that it needed to come from Congress. So you're still in Congress. Will that be something that will be taken up between now and oh, I December? I think it will, absolutely. We have, we've had bipartisan all the way, and I hope it stays bipartisan. But, you know, it's a shame that the manufacturers just say, we want to manufacture everything. Well, you know what? We want to have responsible ownership, too. I come from a state, West Virginia, where we basically take gun ownership very seriously. We have some gun sense. That's all we're asking for. We're not trying to stop things from being sold. We're trying to basically prevent things from de that aren't, aren't even needed in uh, either whether it be self-defense or whether it's hunting or, or uh, sports shooting or whatever. But that's just ridiculous. And uh, I don't know, just just making sure that the right people, hell, they, they won't even agree on, uh, on uh, background checks. If you can't get a person to agree on background checks, my God, and where I come from, everybody, we want to know who in the heck wanted the gun and why they wanted it and if they deserve to have one. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> anything or are we talking about bump stocks? You can talk about anything you want. Okay. Uh, I want to go back to energy. Uh, Steve Wendelin, who's running for uh, Alex Mooney's seat uh, uh, in the second district, he told us on this show, one of the things he, he mentioned is West Virginians just need to get over coal. Coal is, is dead. It's not going to happen. What are your thoughts on the future of coal? I think the added value to coal now, we're looking at different ways, whether it be carbon, carbon fibers, things of that we can do with it. Using coal in the United States of America for just basically heating uh, water and making steam and creating energy, that's not going to continue from the standpoint they're not building any new ones. But we have to have the, old, the, the coal plants we have operating now must continue to operate. And if they don't, we're not going to have a reliability of the energy grid that we need. So saying you're going to get rid of it prematurely, but I can assure you we don't see anyone investing into it. And uh, I've been pushing carbon capture sequestration, which basically captures the CO2 that makes coal burning as clean as humanly possible. We've done everything that we possibly could from scrubbing it, um, you know, to low NOx boilers and capturing uh, ag houses for capturing mercury. We've done everything humanly possible, but carbon capture would be the final the final thing we need to do, and we're trying to perfect that technology and make it more affordable. But So from saying it from that standpoint, but, you know, we're, we're exporting more coal than ever. There's more demand for it, and the prices are higher than they've ever been. It's unbelievable. That was going to be my next question. Totally unbelievable. Do, what percentage do you know, what percentage of West Virginia coal is actually exported to other countries I, I don't know I don't have a number uh, exactly but I can tell you one thing it's probably higher than what we're uh, domestically consuming because the prices the over you know, the price of, uh, of met coal which is made for steel milking steel making which is the finest coal in the world that's about two hundred dollars has been staying at two hundred dollars a ton export coal and it's about a hundred dollars a, uh, a ton for thermal coal so it's been tremendous absolutely tremendous as far as the price and demand for it so it's not it's not diminished diminished anything that we can see is there a future for mining in west virginia i think so absolutely absolutely and you know we're finding all the critical minerals out of our mining too we are starting to extract critical minerals from it so we're looking at every way we can but i can tell you coal is going to be used at a higher value it has to it's 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 a a very valued commodity and we need to have it but we need to use it properly mr harvey uh, good morning senator um let's talk politics real quick uh the, <laughs> recently okay. you you made a pretty major announcement and uh switching to independent and everybody uh -huh. wants to know why in the heck did you do that i've been independent all my life i've never been i've never been uh 
held captive by any party. I've always been I've always identified as Democratic Party because it was the way I was raised. Uh, my grandfather, maybe because uh, I was soon back in the 30s, my grandfather became a Democrat. There was a Democrat growing up because of FDR. So it was kind of a loyalty type thing. But parties never, you know, having a D or an R by your name never changed who I was or how I voted or how I looked at everybody. I never looked at the Republicans that enemy. They're all my friends. I never look at a Democrat having all the answers. We need Republicans to work with us. So I just can't. I, I, I never did understand it. So I just wanted to do it before I left. Just make a statement that I've always been. And I wasn't going to wait until I just retired in January. I said, I'm going to do it now. And basically, and it hasn't caused any problem because everyone knows me well enough. So Joe's not changing at all. Nothing changed. And it hasn't. Well, I, I guess the the timing of it was also coincidental or it well, was that's always, you, yeah they always look at that from that standpoint but you know i've always kind of done things you never erase every option in the world but you never know what will happen because in the political world everything is unknown but no i'm looking forward to uh trying to make the changes from outside the system i've been in, in the senate for 14 years and tried everything i can to make people work together and put country before party but i can see it's almost a, a losing cause there because of the duopoly of the two businesses democrat and republican business is so strong and so profitable they're not going to change their whole mode of operandum is to make you pick a side and hate the other side i'm sorry i can't i can't subscribe to that never have and never will i look at the other side as having answers to help me fix the problem that we both identify and that's not what they're doing in washington so I'm going to be working with my daughter. We're called Americans Together. It's how you put country before party and make decisions based on what's best for our country and not just your party. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're committed to. Senator, you're in a, in a unique position on, as you're on your way out the door, as it were. You've been there long enough. What was the tipping point? It used to be a more cooperative body, Congress. What was the tipping point? When did it get so ugly? What I heard the tipping point was in 2005, you had Bill Frist. They were both leaders, the Republican leader, Bill Frist, and the Democrat leader is Tom Daschle. And when Bill Frist went to South Dakota and, and lobbied and campaigned against Tom Daschle, who he had to work with every day, the way the system set up, he had to work with him every day. And when that changed, it just opened the doors, and they said, well, it's okay for the leaders to do that. We'll all just start attacking each other, and that's what – that's what I've been told, but it's not been good since I've been there, since 2010. Hmm. I remember doing the first interview with you after you were in the Senate, and you said, I, I can't believe this place. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't. I still can't. Well, and, and, and I've tried, so I said, well, you know what? I'm going to try from without. I'll be involved. I'm just going to try working it differently from outside versus inside. You serve on the Committee on the Armed Services, and yesterday Vladimir Putin visited North Korea and struck an yeah. agreement with the North Korean dictator. Obviously, this is very concerning, but on a scale of how concerning, is this something that was already going on because of the replenishments of supplies he needed to conduct his war on the Ukraine, or does this agreement move it up to a very concerned scale of like 10 of 10 here? Well, you should be concerned, Rob. Basically, you have four countries of concern that will never have our values. That's Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And they're trying to form an alliance to a certain extent to basically challenge the West, which is all the freedom-loving democracies around the world. And they want, to, you know, they want to show that we can't operate, we can't govern ourselves, and we have to be better than that and lift up above where we are today because we're not showing the rest of the free world you know how to do it and they're looking for leadership and that's always been the usa and that worries me too but with that it's dangerous it's a dangerous world that we live in and you can only have peace through strength and that's why i've been supporting the military i'm voting to plus up the military even more and when you think about the debt that we're carrying right now and this is going to be the first year that the debt the interest on the debt has exceeded is exceeding basically uh, the defense, the money that we spend on defense to defend ourselves. That's just wrong. You can't continue this. You can't sustain it. You can't continue it. What is the readiness of our military, Senator Manchin, considering we've been supplying the Ukraine, we've been supplying Israel? How are we ourselves? We're, we're, well, we need to, you know, we've been, we've been supplying them with an awful lot of inventory we've had for a long time. So we're resupplying ourselves with all the new modern technology. So there's kind of a win-win in that. You know, we're helping, we're learning from what's going on in Europe. 
in the war, and also we're helping ourselves by improving and basically modernizing our arsenal. But we need to up our, uh, up our production. World War II, we were the arsenal for the world in the 30s, and it helped basically win the world you know, and save the world from fascism. And now we're facing the same thing, but there's other countries that have to step to the plate too, and they all are. But we are the leaders there, and uh, we are stepping up our game. So we have the greatest military in the world. We are able to do about anything that we need to do, but I can tell you it's being challenged more than ever before. I've always been concerned that we have, going back to the example of the 30s and 40s, the, we were also the manufacturing facility for the, the world. Sure. We have shipped yeah. so much of that manufacturing facility off to, say, China, and China is you know, going to project out who is a likely enemy, hopefully yeah. nobody, but if we're going to deep select a likely enemy, it would be China. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do we get that back? Well, we are getting it back. We're bringing it back, and that's what the bills were intended to do. The IRA bill, when I wrote that with my staff, we wrote that bill basically based on energy security and re, uh, re, reinsurging basically domestic incentives to bring all that back that we let go since NAFTA way back in the, the 90s. And that has to change. We have to bring it back. It's coming back, and it takes a little bit of time to build it up, but we just can't wait any longer. So I think we're on the right track. It's just we made mistakes, and we got to fix them, period. Hey, guys, I'm going to have to run real quick here. i got gotcha. another appointment to go to, but let me just tell you all, sure. this is a great day for West Virginia, and it's always a great day to be an American. But happy birthday to our great state and everything that we've done for this great country. And I am so proud. We've done the heavy lifting. We've mined the coal, made the— that made the guns and, and ships, that made the industrial might. We've done everything this little, this country has asked this little state to do, and we're the energy producers. We're the juggernauts for this country, too, and they're still counting on us, and we're still producing. So I'm very proud to be a West Virginian. I know you are, too. Thank you, Senator Manchin. As always, we appreciate the time this morning. Thanks, Rob. Sure thing, buddy. Sorry I have to run. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Senator Joe Manchin and